Hello, and welcome to the Gamer's Closet. I'm your host, Douglas Weed, and today we're going to be talking about Sunken City. Sunken City is a game manufactured by Uberplay Games, which is a European game company, in 2004. This game seats two to four players, runs for about 45 minutes of game time, and is rated for ages eight and up. It is a roll, spin, and movement game, and a tile placement game. But let's dig into it a little further, shall we? Sunken City was created by Uberplay Games in 2004. The premise of this game is hundreds of years ago, a wealthy city was struck by a giant tidal wave. The city was fortunate while the wave destroyed everything in its path, the city itself sank beneath the waves nearly intact. Now it rests at the bottom of a deep lake, its treasures guarded by Neptune. Again and again, players use magical powers to raise portions of the city up from the deep waters in their search of treasure. They move from building to building along the cobblestone streets. They keep whatever they find and return to their village in order to protect their treasures from the wrath of Neptune, as anyone caught by him loses everything. Angered by the intrusion, Neptune stalks the intruders and sinks everything in his path. The winner is the player who has accumulated the most treasure in his village at the end of the game. This game does come with multiple pieces. It comes with 44 treasure tiles, 30 street tiles, 24 movement cards, 12 Neptune chips, four rule summary cards, four adventurer pawns, four adventurer boards, 12 building cubes numbered uh, one through 10 with two additional replacement cubes, one Neptune figurine, one gay board, three specially marked six-sided dice, one beige, one black, and one purple, and one eight-page colored illustrated rule book. To set up this game, place the game board in the middle of the table and give each player in their chosen color one adventurer pawn, six movement cards, eleven treasures, one adventurer board, and one rule summary. Place the adventurers in their respective villages. Each player takes their movement cards into their hand and places their adventurer board and rule summary in front of them. The treasures are placed roof side up onto the adventurer board as follows. Treasure 1 onto space 1, treasure 2 onto space 2, and so on. Place buildings 1 through 9 onto their corresponding grotto spaces. Place building 10 into the dark blue water space in the middle of the game board. Place Neptune onto building 10. Use the following dice depending on the number of players. Beige for 2 players, black for 3 players, and purple for 4 players. Unused dice are placed back into the game box. Place the eight Neptune chips next to the game board. Please note if there are only two players playing, they must choose colors which lie diagonally opposite from each other when picking a starting color. Place the following number of street tiles onto the first street space. 20 if you're playing a two-player game, 23 if in a three-player game, and 26 if in a four-player game. These street tiles are placed face up. Then place one street tile face down onto each of the street spaces, two through five. Space six will remain open. Any remaining street tiles are placed back into the game box and not used. The youngest player starts. Play continues in a clockwise direction. The player whose turn it is plays a movement card from their hand. To play a movement card, the active player chooses a card and places it face up in front of them. Each card permits three different actions. The first is raising up streets and buildings. The second is moving Neptune. And the third is moving the adventurer pawn. The order in which these actions are carried out is up to the player. The upper number on each movement card indicates how many streets and or buildings rise up on the game board. The lower number on each movement card indicates how many spaces an adventurer pawn may be moved. Movement cards once played remain on the table in front of the player until that player has played all six of their movement cards. At that point, they may take all of their movement cards back into their hand. When playing a movement card, a player must place the exact number of city pieces as shown on the movement card. However, only one building may rise up on any given turn. For example, a player who plays a movement card that permits the rising of three city pieces has the choice between three street tiles or two street tiles and one building. Streets rise by having a player take the upmost street tile from the current pile, initially the face-up pile on street space 1, and placing it onto the game board. 
Streets may be placed anywhere except for the single dark blue space in the middle of the board. They may touch other streets as well as buildings. If two streets touch only at the corners, they are not considered connected. Please note streets may not be placed such that an adventurer cannot leave or enter his village. Buildings rise up when a player chooses a building from any of the building grottos and places it onto the game board. Buildings may only be placed onto the dark blue spaces on the board. They may not touch each other, not even at the corners. Both buildings and streets may be placed such that they are completely surrounded by water. Adventurers move into the buildings in order to claim the hidden treasures. An adventurer may move up to as many spaces as indicated by the lower number on the movement card. Adventurers may only move over streets and buildings, never open water. Each street or building tile counts as one space and requires one movement to do so. Adventurers may move vertically or horizontally, but never diagonally. Multiple adventurers may share a space or building. Adventurers may move both forwards and backwards in a single turn. If an adventurer enters a building in order to find a treasure or return to their village in order to bring treasures to safety, they may keep moving immediately after dropping off their treasures, provided there are remaining movement points available. At the start of the game, all treasures on the adventurer board lie with their roof sides face up. Over the course of the game, adventurers enter buildings on the great board. As soon as a player's adventurer enters a building, they turn over the corresponding treasure on the adventurer board, so that the treasure shows face up. Multiple treasures may be claimed or turned over in a single turn, providing that the player has enough movement points to do so. Treasures located on the adventurer board are not safe from Neptune. Only when an adventurer returns to their village may that player take the treasure side tiles from the adventure board and place them into the tower field within the village. Here the treasures are safe and are stored until the end of the game. Treasures lying on the adventurer board with the roof side up indicate that the adventurer must still seek out the corresponding buildings and find those treasures. Treasures laying on the adventurer board with the treasure side up indicate that the adventurer has found that treasure, but he has yet to bring it to safety. Empty spaces on the adventurer board indicate that the adventurer has brought those treasures to safety to their village tower. At any time during your turn, a player may choose to move Neptune, provided that they're not entirely surrounded by water. At the start of the game, Neptune sits on building 10 in the middle of the game board. Neptune moves just like an adventure. He moves only along streets and through buildings, and he may not move onto villages. If Neptune is standing on a city piece that is completely surrounded by water, for example, having no connection to streets or buildings, he may not move and must remain on that city piece. If Neptune is within the territory of a player, indicated by the color border along the lake shore, and within the lake, that player may move Neptune up to three in a three or four player game, or four in a two player game. If Neptune is outside of the player's territory, the player must roll the dice and see how far Neptune can move. He may only move Neptune up to the number of spaces indicated by the die roll. Please note, if Neptune is standing on a street which is only partially within a player's territory, he is still considered to be located within the player's territory. When Neptune moves off of streets or buildings, they sink back into the lake and are removed from the game board. This also includes the building on which he started. Buildings are placed back in their corresponding grotto. Streets are placed face down onto street space too. If building 10 has been sunk, then any other building may be raised up in the space in the middle of the game board. Any adventurer sitting on a city piece that sinks must return back to their village. As long as the adventurer is sitting on the city piece upon which Neptune's movement ends, nothing happens to the adventurer. That player has an opportunity to possibly elude Neptune on their next turn. Only when Neptune leaves the space does it sink, forcing the adventurer to return to their village. When an adventurer is forced to return to their village, any treasures with the treasure site up on their adventurer board are turned back over again. These treasures are confiscated by Neptune and must be found once again. When a player's adventurer is returned to their village by another player moving Neptune over the space on which the adventurer sat, the players whose adventurer was returned receives a Neptune chip. This chip may be used to prevent additional movement on a subsequent turn. Please note that any player who moves Neptune past their own adventurer, thereby forcing his own return to the village, does not receive a Neptune chip. 
On a player's turn, they have the option of using their Neptune chip. With the chip's assistance, a player may move extra spaces in addition to the number of movement points indicated by the current movement card. The number of extra spaces permitted is equal to the number of treasures turned roof side up on their adventurer board. Finding treasures and therefore turning those treasures over on the adventurer board during a Neptune chip assisted turn has no effect on the number of additional movement points permitted during that turn. A player may possess multiple Neptune chips, but may only ever use one per turn. Used chips are returned to the supply pile. The space in the middle of the game board is a special space in which only buildings may rise up. Any player who reaches a building located on this space may claim not only that building's treasure, but also a special treasure, which is treasure number 12, the treasure chest. If that player has already found that building's treasure early in the game and has it either turned over on their adventure board or secured away in their village, then only the treasure chest is turned over. The treasure chest is treated just like a regular treasure. It too is only secure once it's been brought back to the village. If a player has already secured the treasure chest and they move into that building in the middle of the board, they only turn over the treasure found in that building. A player's turn is over once they have completed all of their actions. Play then passes to the next player on the left. If a player is unwilling or unable to move Neptune, then their turn ends after their two actions of raising the city pieces and moving their adventurer have been completed. The streets dictate the end of the game. Once the stack of street tiles on street space 1 is exhausted, the stack of discarded street tiles on street space 2 is immediately, even in the middle of a player's turn, turned face up. From that point on, anyone choosing to raise up a street takes the tile from street space 2. Newly sunken streets are now discarded onto street space 3 face down. This process continues through the remaining street spaces. There are two triggers of the end of the game. The first is a player collecting all 10 of their treasures plus treasure 12 and have brought them safely back to their village. The second is the stack of street tiles on street space 5 is exhausted, revealing the sand timer. In order to ensure that each player has the same number of turns, the final round of the game is played through to the end. If the game end was triggered by the sand timer, players who have yet to take their final turn may choose street tiles from street space 6 to raise up. Sunken streets are still returned to street space 6. The winner is the player with the greatest number of treasures in their village at the end of the game. If multiple players are tied, the total value of their treasures is told. The tie is broken by the player with the highest total. In rare instances, it is possible that the supply of street tiles may run out. If this happens, no streets can rise up until some have been sunk again. If there are insufficient streets available, then the streets and building rise up action becomes optional. The game does come with a couple of variant options. If you wish to play a shorter game, then play without the number one building and its associated treasure. If you do want to play on a tougher game with more of a cutthroat level to it, then play without Neptune ships. Now players are forced to return to their villages and they don't receive anything. Well, this has been an overview of Sunken City from Uberplay Games. This game is a very well-built game. Uh, from an art point of view, the board looks great, the pieces look great, the buildings look great. So some effort went into the look of this game. Uh, the playability of this game is really nice. It has simple pieces, the rules aren't too complicated, so it's a very easy game for kids to pick up. The rules are very easy to understand. They're a little open to interpretation, which is kind of nice for a basic strategy game. But again, it's not too complicated. Uh, as games go, it's not relatively expensive. It goes online for, for about $20 to $40 for most uh, um, online locations. So it is not hard to get. Um, the game is uh, well organized. It's very, very simple, and it is very clear-cut. So if you haven't played Sunken City before, I actually would recommend playing this game. It is a decent game, especially if you want a nice, lax game night. Um, and again, the pieces look really nice. So if you haven't played this game before, I would recommend playing this game. Well, that's it from us here at the Gamer's Closet. We'd like to thank you for checking out our video on Sunken City from Uberplay Games. If there's a game in the future you'd like us to review or go over, please put it in the comments below. Please hit subscribe so that we can be the first to check out our future content. And as always, please have a great gaming day.